Good morning. We actually don't have a lot of time, so I don't see, and unfortunately, very few of you are in the call. So if I take off my two devices, it means that you're seven of you. So we are just going to give them four more minutes and we shall start immediately. Because we don't have a lot of time and we need to finish the syllabus. So let's just wait for three more minutes and then we'll start. And, and maybe to remind you is that uh, we will need to, we need to, to, to also have Friday lessons. So I asked your class representative and he suggested Friday one, eight to nine. So we shall also continue and finish that. So we need, we need to finish today's, uh, today's um, topic and also to, to go through a little bit of receivers, which is mainly digital homes. Now, sorry, which is mainly digital, digital modulation. Now, of course, the obvious things that digital modulation, I'll be reminding you some of the things that we learned, but in this particular case, we shall be putting them into perspective, perspective especially trying to see how the receivers perform uh, in line with, uh, with the course that we're doing. I know last time when we were doing digital modulation, we were basically looking at the actual analysis and, and the, I'm not sure, I think we did a little bit of the performance, but maybe not so much. Yeah, so we need to, to, to go through and finish. Okay, um, uh, two more minutes and then we start. So in the meantime, in the meantime, let's just wait for these late comers. So, but we are not going to wait beyond two more minutes. So I think we will just start. The rest of the people will uh, join us. Um, now, I'm not sure how we are going to have a tutorial, but we'll need to finish that. Maybe we can finish this and then have a tutorial. But probably if we are going to have a tutorial, I suggest that we have a, a physical tutorial because <clears throat> the problem of teaching online is always difficult to know whether people have understood or not. As you can see, especially given the short semester that we have had, I'm not. I'm sure I'm not the only one who is doing this, but most of us are teaching really to finish the syllabus. I am not sure whether you have understood and uh, none of you has really raised any questions and neither have you asked me to do so, to repeat something. 
I told you from the very beginning, it is really up to you to tell me because online, all of you are covering, are covering your faces, of course, which is okay, I'm not really complaining. But because I'm not physically looking at you, I cannot in any way tell whether you have understood or not. So every time I ask a question and you do not answer, of course, remember, like I've already said, I'm trying to finish the, the topic. I'm trying to finish the topic, so that, that is uh, going to always be a problem. Now, I would like to know, are you all hearing me clearly? If I continue. Can I have a response? Are you all hearing me clearly? Okay, uh, Akoi say yes, and custom is also saying yes. Okay, so then that's fine. <clears throat> Please let me know if there's any problem. As, as you know, as you know, these days the internet is not the best, is not our best friend. So just let me know if I follow for anything like that. Okay, so we are now starting a new topic and that is channel coding. If you remember, last time we we were looking at at data communication, and uh, maybe before I start, let me just uh, remind you at which stage of the digital communication diagram we are at. Eh? Okay. So if you remember, in, in our digital communication diagram, as always, okay, we had the data, the raw data. Of course, we have our source here. Okay, it goes through data co source coding or digital to analog. Let me put the ADC, ADC. Just a minute. ADC. Okay. Then we have seen that it goes again data compression. Let me call it data comp. Okay. And right now, what we are going to look at next is channel coding. Okay. So this is now how our information or our digital communication system looks like. So if you remember, this is basically our source. Let me call it S. If our source information is in form of analog signals or analog information info, it means that we have to go through an analog to digital conversion. We call this one lossy source coding. Okay, and now out at the output here, which would be our S maybe Spigo. Okay, it means that now the information which we have right now is actually digital information. So here we input analog and we have output digital. We input analog and now we have output a digital information. Now, I always love to ask you the different forms of digital information. Of course, when we were looking at data compression, specifically, we would be looking at speech. And in this particular case, we are looking at, um, if you remember, we said that most of these algorithms, when they were being really, initially, when they were being developed, they were developed for the English alphabet. OK, so in this case, if we are talking of the English alphabet, basically we are saying that the digital information which is coming in here, for instance, could be the alphabet, the, the, the ABCD up to, e, to Z, ABCD up to Z. But there is different form of digital information. Of course, in most cases, the digital information, like if when we are looking, if you remember, if when we did the PCM, PCM, if you remember what PCM was, pulse coded modulation, Okay, we found that in pass coded modulation, the information that actually comes out of here is the sequences of zeros and ones. Okay, so if that is the case, it means that if you are 
if you're not dealing with the digital information, which is the alphabet, okay. By the way, how many levels does the, 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 the does the alphabet have? How many levels does the alphabet have? Does someone know? Okay, those are some of the things you should be asking yourself, okay? Because remember when we're doing, talking of quantization and all those kinds of things, then it's, it's, it's some of the information, some of the intrig intriguing kind of questions you should be asking yourself. So if we're dealing with PCM, so if this is PCM, so what we'll be having here is our sequences of zeros and one. If we are dealing with a text, what we'll be having here is our sequences of A, as, as A up to Z or up to Z, like some people say. So when we come here, we say that we are doing compression, just like the name suggests, it means that we are taking out redundancy. And when we are taking out redundancy, we are effectively saying that we'd like to use, we'd love to use our channel bandwidth effectively, okay? So if you're taking out redundancy, it means that you're going to compact, just like the name suggests, you're going to compact a lot of information. So instead of, for instance, having one information, you could have several information fitting in the same bandwidth. And if that is the case, then it means that you're transmitting or transmitting or, or, or whatever it is, propagating a lot of information. Okay, so that is basically data compression. So this, we also say that these two, so this is lossy source coding, this is lossless, Source coding. Okay. And we say that this lossless source coding is governed by Shannon's rule. Remember, Shannon has three very important theorems. Okay. Shannon has three very important theorems. We have the Shannon channel capacity. We have the Shannon's uh, source coding theorem, source coding theorem. And of course, right now, when we are going to be looking at channel coding, we are going to look at the third one, which is basically Shannon's channel coding theorem. So this was source coding theorem. So this would be channel coding theorem. Okay, now when we're looking at data compression, I told you that the entropy is directly related to the channel capacity. And if you remember from the definition of the of the of what we say the source coding was, or in other words, the source coding theorem, you will you will realize, especially when you come to your, the actual performance of your communication system in your fourth year when you're doing your projects, you will see, you will be talking of channel capacity, you'll be talking of, of, of those kinds of things. You are not going to go back to say, okay, I, I did data compression. In fact, data compression won't even be an issue, but you will be keep talking of, of source coding, of so, sorry, you keep talking of channel capacity, channel capacity. So, so we use channel capacity as one of the measures to measure the performance of our communication system. And I know that in this particular topic, we were not required to look at how channel capacity relates to data compression, but later on, you will actually see that you, you use data compression in, in the measurement of your channel capacity. So the, there are, these three theorems are indirectly related to one another, okay? So anyway, so that was ADC. This was data compression. Now we are going to look at channel coding and then from channel coding, we, we would be looking at digital comms, digital modulation, but like I told you, digital modulation, we covered it extensively when we're looking at communication theory. So I'm not really going to go through it. The only part I want to go through is when we are looking at digital modulation, I want us to actually look at the receiver design. In other words, look at how the performance or, or measure the performance of a communication system. Okay. And of course, from there, we go to the channel. And if you remember last time when we were looking at uh, communication theory, I, I told you that rarely do we really pay attention at what happens at the receiver. But the truth is that whatever you have at the transmitter, you have the opposite at the receiver. Whatever you have at the transmitter, you have the opposite at the receiver. Okay, so when we are going to be looking at channel design, we, we will be looking at also the performance of our decoder. So here, this would be a digital D mode. 
the modulator. This would be our channel, sorry, channel decoder. And then this would be our, the opposite. So this was a data compressor. So you would have the opposite. So of course this would be the compressor. I don't want to use the word decompressor, but okay. So you basically have the opposite. And of course this would be our, this is analog to digital conversion. So this will be digital to analog conversion. Okay. So I just thought I should remind you that. Uh, I thought I should actually remind you that because uh, I know that uh, sometimes it may not be easy for you to remember. And like I've said, if we were in class, this is something I would be asking all of you to keep now and again to keep drawing so that it, it actually sinks, sinks in. But since we are not physically together, it becomes difficult to actually Oh yeah, to, 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 to keep asking. So, but every time I mention something like that, I would expect that you go back and remind yourselves of how this actually looks like. Okay, so, so we are looking at channel coding. Oh, sorry, sorry, this is, uh, no, 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 that's not what I want to share. So that will be the next topic that we'll be looking at. That will be the next topic, topic that we'll be looking at. Come on. Okay, I don't know what's going on. Let me just, let me just, uh, let me just uh, minimize it because it is interfering. Okay, so, so today we will be looking at channel coding and I wish and I hope that we'll be able to go through very quickly so that we can finish this topic and have a few more, maybe have a week or so where we just go through examples, especially for the entire course. Now I realize that we haven't had that chance to go through, so probably it will be a good time for us to go through together. <clears throat> So as always, whenever we introduce a topic, the first thing you should be asking yourself is what is channel coding and what is the role of channel coding in a digital communication system? Those are very important questions. So if you can answer that, then you'll be able to know what channel coding is. Channel coding, again, in your book is chapter 10. And Simon Hawkins is chapter 10, okay? Simon Hankins goes through the details of what channel coding is all about and gives very many examples, including modern day uh, communications in channel coding. But I'm not going to really go through all those details. All I'm doing in this particular topic and in this particular course is to introduce the basics in terms of digital communication. So I will just look at just briefly at how the, the, the encoders work and the rest of the details, you can always learn them on your own, especially when you, 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 you further your, your career in terms of communication. Now you will realize that communication theory and digital comm are actually, communication theory and digital comms are functions of the physical layer, okay? When you finally study uh, the different levels of communication, you will find that there are different levels. There are, there are about seven levels of the ISL. And then depending on whether you're dealing with the voice or dealing with internet, you will find that there are different ways of how you can actually communicate through these different layers. And these topics, communication theory and digital communications are basically based at the physical layer, the actual activities that do take place in the, in, in the the, in the, 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 this, the processing of the information before you do the transmission. So these are processes, the processes we have been looking at are processes which are done at the physical layer. Okay, so you'll find this in, uh, in, chap in chapter 10 of your Simon Hawkins. Now, like I've already told you, these are questions when someone says, what is data communication? The first thing you should be asking yourself is what does it mean? What, how does it work? What is its advantages? What are the disadvantages? Because these are the same questions that you'll actually be 
asked and then you will be we are supposed to understand okay so the first question is what is channel coding what is the advantage of channel coding what are the disadvantages of channel coding and how is channel coding implemented okay so that's what we'll be trying to do and look at in this particular uh, course now just like the name suggests okay we if you remember when we are looking at communication, especially in communication theory, we say that there are different errors that are introduced as a result of our communication channel, or just by the fact that you're communicating. And the common one which we talked about was noise. We even went further to define how noise is and how it actually affects our communication. But we only looked at internal noise. But there are other forms of noise. When you're communicating, you have noise from other users, especially if you are on the same, on the same channel. You have noise. Of course, we have uh, the, the Gaussian noise, which we went into at length to, to determine how it actually works. And from your, from your propagation, you also saw that there are, there's also different types of noise as a result, purely because of the channel, things like fading, and then <laughs> things like fading, then we have interference from other users. Then you can also have the same signal interfering with, with itself as a result of delays, okay? And I think you have actually gone through all these kinds of, 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 of this, this kinds of, of corruption that the information as you transmit that tends to corrupt your, the, the, the bits or the information that you're trying to transmit. So the question then is that what introduces errors in a communication system? Of course, we when we have errors, we talk of single bit errors. Okay, these are mainly errors as a result of additive white Gaussian noise. Okay, then we talk of burst errors. The burst errors are errors which are mainly due to the fading channel. You can find that within a specific time or within a specific period, the signal can completely be swamped off as a result of fading, okay? So now we have those types of errors. Now, the problem is that if you're trying to communicate and the, then you face errors, then it is upon you as a communication engineer to try and minimize those errors because if those errors are very mm, large, it means that you are not being able to, to effectively transmit your information, okay? So that's very, very important. So when we are measuring communication systems on top of measuring the channel capacity, the other thing that we tend to measure is what we call the bit error rate. And you will find this, especially when you're characterizing your communication system during your fourth year or during your projects. So we talk in terms of, of bit error rate or symbol error rate or frame error rate. And this is basically the probability of receiving a bit in error, okay? It's basically the, the probability of receiving the bit in error. Now, the, the bit error rate depends, is dependent on the application. In other words, each channel has its own acceptable bit error rate, or even if each application. For instance, in a voice, you're not supposed to go beyond zero point, uh, I think it's 10 to the minus three, uh, which is basically the acceptable probability. So what, that, what does that mean? It means that if you have a communication system and you're trying to design one and you're trying to effect whatever system or application that you're trying to implement, if your voice communication goes beyond that error, then it is not acceptable and it will not be realized. So we say that your communication system is not good, okay? So each application has its own acceptable given range. Each application, each channel has its own acceptable range, okay? Mm -hmm. So most of the errors, I think we have already said this, most of the errors in the communication system are due to the channel. That's why we call it channel coding. Most of the errors are due to the channel. That's why we call it channel coding, okay? That's where the name comes from. So what is the role of channel coding? Basically, when you're trying to com communicate, remember, you have two communication resources. And those two communication resources are always power and bandwidth. 
we saw that data compression tries to make sure that you use your bandwidth more effectively. However, in uh, power, there are two ways to look at it. Okay. For instance, if you have a lot of errors, you could increase your power to minimize the number of errors. If you have a lot of errors, it means that your information you're trying to transmit is not reaching, is, is not having a wide coverage. So what do you normally do? You increase the amount of power that your signal is, be, is, 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 your signal is carrying or propagating. The signal is carrying or propagating, okay? So, and, and by doing that, then you are able to make sure that your information reaches where you want it to actually be. So when you want to minimize, in other words, if you remember when we are doing digital communications, we say that one of the problems, one, one of the reasons that we do not use um, modulations which are high, for MPSK modulations, which is higher than four is because the more you increase the MPSK, the higher you, you increase the probability of error. And therefore for you to really minimize that, you have to increase the power so that you can compensate for the errors which are being introduced. So in other words, error, removing the errors or what we call error control coding, reduces on the amount of power which you can actually transmit. So the reliable communication over a noisy channel is attained through error control. Because you are trying to make sure that the information you're transmitting reaches there and reaches there without any errors. Okay, so <clears throat> this is basically what this slide is trying to say. So channel, co channel coding, sometimes we say channel coding, sometimes we say error control is at the expense of increased bandwidth. Now, Remember when we are looking at data compression, we say that you remove redundancy. Now in channel coding, it's the exact opposite. You introduce redundancy in a controlled manner. And this redundancy basically is trying to make sure that it compensates for the errors which is going to control at the receiver. In other words, going to remove or reduce the number of errors at the receiver. So in channel coding, you are introducing control redundancy. In data compression, you're removing redundancy. So which means that channel coding comes unfortunately at the expense of increased bandwidth. But remember, as a communication engineer, you're trying to make sure that you use, as a communication, communication engineer, you're trying to make sure that you find the optimal solution. The optimal solution of your reducing the errors and the optimal solution of using your bandwidth. So the information capacity offers a trade-off between the channel bandwidth and the signal noise ratio. And of course, as we are going to be seeing, we will see how this actually works. I'm not going to, read it, to repeat this. I've already talked about this. I told you that the errors, I'm not going to repeat that one. So I'll just go straight to another one. So maybe the last, the last, um, Bullets as the use channel, channel encoders to provide reliable transmission in the presence of noise and any other channel environments. Okay, so just like we saw in source coding, I see someone is complaining. Okay, someone is, I, can you hear me? Someone is complaining. We can hear. So uh, above all, maybe you have a problem. Okay, everyone else can hear. Okay, so maybe it is your network. Okay, thank you very much. So just like we saw in channel, in data compression, we say that data compression is governed by this, the source coding theorem, channel source coding theorem. Okay, so channel coding is also governed by Shannon's channel coding theorem. It's governed by Shannon's channel coding theorem, okay? And what does it say? It says that for a discrete source of, <coughs> of rate RS and entropy HS and emitting symbols at every TS, uh, every TS seconds through a discrete momentous channel of a capacity and coherence time TC, there exists a coding scheme for which there is minimal error provided, and this is a very important condition, this is a very important condition. Provided RS, which is basically the rate of the source, 
divided by the period of the source or the frequency of the source. And we know that the rate of the source is given by the entropy. In other words, it's limited by the entropy. So here we are talking the limit, we are taking the limit. So the rate of the source is in this particular case, if it is to follow the normal source coding theorems, it is basically going to be falling under the, the entropy. So again, we have TS. If you are going to have a channel coding theorem, sorry, a channel encoder that offers you reliable communication. In other words, when we say reliable communication, it means that it offers you minimal errors or acceptable number of errors. Then this rate should be much, so, so this rate should be less than the channel rate. So the source rate should be less than the channel rate. And this makes a lot of sense. It means that if you have a source rate which is higher than the channel capacity, then you're going to have errors. Look at it this way. It's like having a lot of water and you're trying to pass it through a very small pipe, okay? So the channel capacity gives you the limit beyond which you are going to start making errors. So if your source rate is much higher than the channel capacity rate, so if the source rate is higher than the channel capacity, then you're going to start making errors. So that's simply what Shannon's channel coding theorem says. So that theorem, in other words, says that if your channel capacity, so if your source rate is higher than the channel capacity, then you're going to make errors. If your source rate is higher than the channel capacity, then you're going to make errors. And I think this makes a lot of sense because you cannot have a rate, you cannot be trying to transmit through a channel which has, le which has a less rate than the source rate. It means the information you're trying to transmit through is actually going to be having problems. It's not going to fit through the, the channel that you're trying to use. Okay. Of course, this you look, looking at it mathematically, that's how it would be. But of course, we know that that is not exactly the case. We can always delay the information. We can always send it in bits and all those things. But of course, as we see, if we, are, we do that, then we are going to be faced with problems. Now, there is a catch in Shannon's, in, Shannon, in Shannon's channel coding theorem. As much as we are able to meet reliable communication by meeting this condition, Shannon does not show us which particular code to use. Shannon does not tell us which particular code to use. So the theorem does not specify what is the minimal error and neither does it point us to the specific coding scheme that we are supposed to use, okay? The theorem does not specify the probability of error but points to the fact that the probability of the symbol error tends to zero with increasing code length, okay? And of course, as we know that C is the fundamental limit of the rate at which the rate for which the transmission of reliable error free messages can also take place. I think this is just a simple repeat. Okay. So, and I hope you still remember what the, the mathematical formula of channel capacity. I hope you still remember the mathematical formula for channel capacity, both for high pass and baseband, both for high pass and baseband. Okay, I hope you still remember that. Okay, so channel capacity introduces redundancy in a controlled manner. I have already said that. Redundancy in a controlled manner. Okay, the receiver exploits the redundancy to decide which symbols were actually transmitted. And we are going to look at a few examples to actually go, we are going to go through a very few examples to see how this is done. Now, the goal of channel encoder and the decoder is to John, 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 please, can you mute yourself? You're making a lot of noise for us. The goal of a channel encoder and the decoder is to make sure that you minimize the amount of noise. In other words, you minimize the amount of errors that are being produced or are being, uh, trans uh, are being relayed along your communication channel. Okay, so that's basically that's it. Now, so there are two modes of channel coding. There are two modes of channel coding, okay? One is what we call automatic repeat requests. Automatic repeat 
request. In this one, the errors are detected. However, they are not corrected. So what happens is that you transmit your information, the receiver receives the information. If the receiver perceives that the information has been transmitted in error, it requests the transmitter to retransmit. Hence the name, automatic repeat request. Now we don't tend to use this type of communication, sorry, this type of error correction at the physical layer. This type of error correction tends to be used at other layers, especially when you're dealing with protocols and at higher, level, higher layers, okay? So in the physical layer, we don't actually use this type of, 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 of correction, error correction. What we tend to use is what we call forward error correction. In the forward error correction, the channel coder, decoder, of course, this is happening at the receiver, it detects that the error has occurred. So it, you go through your normal decoding at the decoder, then the receiver detects that an error has occurred. And when it, is, it detects that the error has occurred, what does it do? It tries to correct the error, okay? So we have automatic repeat request and forward error correction. Now, in this particular course, I'll be using forward error correction or channel coding. They are really one and the same. Okay, they are really one and the same, but we use them either we use we say forward error correction or error. Uh, okay, we shall see exactly how it looks like. So we use them interchangeably. Now, in this particular course, we are going to look at only two examples of types of encoders that we do use, and that is what we call the block codes and the convolution codes. Now, in the block codes, I'm just going to look at the basics of the block codes. I'm not going to enter, I'm not going to look at a given specific example of how the channel encoder actually, sorry, how a block channel encoder looks like. However, for the convolution codes, we shall look at a few examples because it's much easier. Now, there are very many codes that are being used currently on the market. Okay, and one of the codes that they tend to use is what we call table codes. I'm not in any way going to look at table codes, but I want you to know that there are, there are some codes called table codes. These are codes which are basically a, a combination of either two block codes or a block code and a convolution code or a convolution code and a convolution code. It's just basically there are codes which are, you, you, there are two, two, two sets of encoders. You have what we call the inner encoder and an outer encoder and the mechanism of, of, of um, decoding is also there, especially if you take this coding theorem at the higher stage, you will actually find that there are codes. Now the table codes, all I want you to know is that the table codes are some of the best known codes. They are very good, very good codes and they tend to achieve what we call the Shannon's, they tend towards the Shannon's channel coding limit. So as you can tell, when you are talking of the channel rate, you're, first you remember you have the source rate, then you are talking of the channel rate. Now you'll be talking of the, a, 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 the coding rate. So obviously, as you can see, as you go through these different rates, then you're going to reduce your bandwidth or you're going to, this, your channel encoder is going to affect your bandwidth. That's why at the very beginning, I was telling you that channel coding actually affects, it's, in, it's a compromise it compromises your bandwidth because it means that the amount of information that you're going to be transmitting is going to be less. Why is it going to be less? Because you are introducing redundancy. And remember that redundancy does not carry any information. The only thing that is going to do this redundancy is going to help us to detect and correct errors at the receiver, which is also good for us because we are trying to make sure that we are transmitting our, efficient, our information efficiently and reliably reliably, it does not have errors or it has minimal errors, okay? So again, just to re repeat what I've just been talking about, the, we have block codes and convolution codes, okay? The block codes, as we shall see shortly, do not have memory, but the convolution codes do have memory, okay? So the block codes are memoryless and the convolution codes have memory. When we talk of memory, memoryless, if you remember, 
we are, we say that memoirs simply means that the information that is out, the information that is being output. In other words, now would be since we are referring to codes, you mean that the the information or the bits which are coming out of encoder and are are uncorrelated. If it's memoirs, it means that they are not correlated. However, if it has memory, it means that the output which is coming out of our encoder is correlated. In other words, the, the, the information currently at, at a period T1 it relates to the previous period and the previous period and the previous period, depending on the, num the amount of memory that we do have. Now, I'm not going to talk about turbo codes, but the turbo codes, like I told you, are the best codes, okay? They are very complex. They basically a combination of two codes, okay? Which is uh, separated by an interleaver. An interleaver is just something, it's just a, a bridge which helps us to shuffle or introduce randomness in our, in our communication. So I just want you to know that there are codes called compound codes or turbo codes, which are very good. You can always go back and run, learn about them and see how they behave, but we are not going to be looking at them. And of course, also here, the of importance is that the codes that we are going to be looking at are linear codes. Remember, in communication, we are always uh, talking, of, I mean, in engineering, we always have approximations. Most of the time, we assume that most of the systems that we are dealing with are linear, but we are aware that some systems are actually nonlinear. Okay, so let's just go straight to the basics of a linear block code. Okay, so any code, Whenever we have a code, whether it is a, is a block code, a convolution code, the first thing we talk of is the code rate, okay? So the encoder transforms K information bits into a longer N bits. Hence, we have a code rate or we, ha or we have a code, and that is how we write it. It's a code of K upon N, where K is the number of information bits. K is the number of information bits and N, so K is the information bits that enter your encoder. And N is the bits that are coming out of your encoder. So if you have N number of bits that are coming out of your encoder and you input K information bits, it means that you have N minus K redundance bits. N minus K redundant bits. Okay, I hope we are fo you're following. You input K information bits into your encoder and you output N information bits. Sorry, you put input K information bits and you output N, which means you have appended N minus K redundant bits. Okay. So your code rate, therefore, since you have inputting N and you're outputting N, it means that your code rate is K upon N. So you can see now from your source code or your source encoder, you came with the rate of RS and now it's going to be reduced by K divided by N, okay? Then before you even go to your channel. So if you input K information bits, it means that you have two to the power K possible information messages that correspond to a given code word, okay? I want you to keep that in mind because we are going to look at a few examples shortly. A very, a very good example or the very simplest form of a block code is what we call repetition codes. What does that mean? A repetition code means that, for instance, if you have a repetition code of uh, one, upon, one upon two, if you have a repetition code of, of one upon two, well, for example, if you have a repetition code of one upon two, it would mean that you are inputting one information bit and getting out two bits. You are inputting one information bit and getting out two bits, okay? If you have an if, if you have a rate of, if you have a rate of uh, R equals to two upon four, it means that you are inputting, oops, sorry, you're inputting two bits and you're getting four bits. Now, this is a repetition code. So what does it mean? Is that mean? It means that you're taking one bit and repeating it two times. You're taking one bit 
and repeating two times. Okay, maybe let me use this one upon four or the other way around, let me use one upon three. So if it is a rate of one upon three, it means that you're taking one bit and repeating it three times. You're taking one bit and repeating it three times. Now, this is the simplest form of the convolution, sorry, of a block code. The best way to really appreciate this code is if you're looking at the diversity schemes. Because if you have the information that you're repeating three times, the possibilities of you making errors, or in other words, when you reach, reach at the receiver, you're going to look at the bit you transmitted. Let's assume that you transmitted a zero. You transmitted zero, zero. Okay, you took, you had a zero, you repeat it. So you have two, you, you had one zero. So you repeat it, you, instead you have two zeros. So you had one zero. And when you repeated it, you read, if that was the rate of your code and the rate was a half, it means that you took a zero, you repeated two times and you have two zeros. So at the receiver, you might find that you receive either zero one or you receive zero zero. You either receive zero one or zero zero or one one. Okay. Now you take a guess because you say, okay, if I, if I transmitted zero zero, and it was for zero, but now I have received one one. So you definitely know that if this is what you transmitted, this was definitely received in error. There's no way you could have transmitted a zero zero and got a, a, a one one, okay? So you know definitely that that was transmitted in error. The same applies to if you had, for instance, a three. So it means that you had zero and you repeated it three times, okay? But you could have received maybe zero zero or zero one or something like this, or, or, or something like this. I'm just, just giving an, because this one you have, you have eight possibilities. So if you receive something like this, you know, okay, yes, I transmitted a zero and I've received only one zero, which means the information I transmitted must have been a zero. The same applies to this. So here you pick, for instance, here you have two, two ones. So you would pick the one which gives you the highest number. So you say, okay, I, I have received two ones, so there are five. I have, I must have transmitted one, okay? Because you're using the probability that gives you the highest possibility, okay? So that is the simplest form. So a repetition code is the simplest form of a, a block code, okay? But there are other codes, there are humming codes, there are cyclic redundant block codes, which are now actually very common, especially they are being used in the turbo codes. So, I mean, there are so many codes which you can actually use. There are Reed Solomon codes and many other codes that you will find. Okay, but for me, I'm like I've told you, I'm just taking you through the basics of block codes. We are not really going to look at any specific code in details, but when you're doing your, 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 your analysis of your communication system in your fourth year projects, you probably will find that you need to go through these details and see what you can get. Okay, so the code rate measures the amount of information conveyed in each block, in each code one. I think that one we have already seen. The higher the code rate, the lower the redundant bits. Okay, I think that's what also we just demonstrated that when we are using the the, 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 the the repetition code and the message rate and the channel code rates are fixed design parameters. Okay, that one we shall see exactly what I mean. And what is the probability of error for a block code? Of course, we shall also see what those ones is by looking at a few examples. So let's just take a few examples. Okay, this one I got from your Simon Hawkins. It just shows you the different types of codes and how they approach the Shannon capacity theorem. Okay, I think this one you can read from your Simon Hawkins and see what it is. But let me just go through and let's take an example of this particular code. Remember what we say? We say that the codes are linear. We assume that all the codes, whether they, excuse me, whether they are convolution codes or block codes, they must be linear. That's what we said. They must be linear codes. Okay, that's one of the things that we said. So in this particular case, we are looking at a, a block code which follows the Golius field of two. In other words, it follows the the the, the ultimate two the two ultimate or the what we call the the radix two. What do we mean by that? We simply mean this, these particular codes follow the, uh, the best two. Okay, that's what it simply means that we, are, we do our mathematics, we do our arithmetic, we do our subtraction and whatever it is, 
but we are all based in the base two. Of course, like we know that in base 10, we do zero up to nine, okay? So in base two, basically we have zero and one. If it was base three, then we'd have zero, one, two, three, okay? So this is basically what this means. So it says that if we have a subset S or VN in the subspace, then it means that we have, remember I told you that you take V information bit and then you turn it, in other words, we use K information bits and we turn it into N outputs of, the output bits of our encoder, okay? So these are some of the, the, the some of the, <coughs> of the, of the, of the, what do you call it, characteristics of your block codes or linear block codes for that matter, okay? So you have, it says that the all zero set is basically a subset or is a vector of S, okay? And any two sums, the sums of any two vectors in the subspace are, is also equal to, is, in other words, it's a member of the subspace. Okay, Ababu, please, can you mute your, Ababu, mute your, mute your, what do you call it? Please mute your, your, your mic. Okay. okay, so the O0 set is always a code word. And if you sum any two code words, you should always have a, an arithmetic. In other words, you should always have a subset. It, the, the, the sum of two code words is a subset of, of your code word. The scalar multiplication is also a subset of, of your code word. And of course we have the scalar addition is also the same thing. And for example, if we have two bits, so if we have four bits, you remember what I told you, if we take four bits, if we take four bits, if we input four bits into our encoder, this is the possible sample space. This is the possible sample space, okay? This is a possible sample space. So we could have 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, up to 1, 1, 1. So if we take any of these two code ones, in, in other words, if we take any of these two possibilities and add them together, the sum of this should actually be a subset of this possible code word. For instance, let's take these two. If we take these two code ones and add them together, what do you get? Let me find out. If you take these two code words and add them together, what do you get? Can someone help us with the answer? If you add to these two, 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 of these code words, what do you get? Can someone give us the answer? If we take these two code words and add them, what do we get? If we take these two code words and add them up, what do we get? Okay, so here we have one plus one, oops, one plus one. one plus one, and then we have one, one plus one, and then we have one plus one, and then we have zero, zero plus one. So what do we have? So the first one is, let me first see what your answers are. Okay. So all I can see, there's only one person. Bulwani Isaac is the only one who has got it. Uh, Emmanuel Victor has got the exact opposite. Okay. So what is one plus one? What is one plus one? Because remember, we are dealing with best two. One plus one is equal to, what is one plus one in base two? What is one plus one in base two? I'm waiting for the answer. What is one plus one in base two? One plus one in base two according to, according to Ian is one zero. Uh -huh. I like the way Ivan has put it. 
Is it Ivan? Yes. Wamoto Ivan has put it very nicely, and even Maria has put it nicely. Okay. One plus one is one remainder zero. Is one remainder zero. Okay. One plus one is one remainder zero. One remainder zero. So therefore, what does that mean? It means that we have one plus one equals to zero, isn't it? Because we cannot write one zero. Okay. So we'll have to rewrite zero. Okay. So that one plus one equals to zero. One plus one equals to zero. One plus one equals to zero. Zero plus one equals to one. So therefore our code, the resultant code from this, the resultant code from this would be, the resultant code from this would be zero, 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 one. And as you can see this zero, 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 one, is actually a subset of this particular code. So this is what is this is trying to explain. Okay, this is what is trying to explain. So in other words, the multiplication equals to the multiplication should result into a, a code which is within the subset. Addition should result into a code which is within the subset, and the multiplication should result into a code which is within the subset. Okay. Let me see what people are saying. Do you just abandon it? And now I'm not going to answer that question because that's what you did in your primary. You did, you remember when you were doing primary best twos in your primary? That's what you did, okay? So you, you ask your friends and go back and find out why it is zero and not, not one zero, okay? And maybe the best way to look at it is if you remind yourself of, what did you call that? Was that digital electronics? I don't remember, is it digital electronics where you have alls and eh, those exclusive alls? Eh? Is it digital electronics? Where you have ex exclusive alls and all those kinds of things. Yeah, so you can go back and remind yourself some of those things. So anyway, so that's what you have. So if you have one, zero, one, one, and you add to this one, this is what you have. So this is one, zero, one, one. So you have one, zero, one, one, which is a subset of this space, which is a subset of that space. So you, you use one, one, zero, one, one is right here. Okay, this is what we have. So, and if you do the multiplication, it's the same story. In again, the multiplication in the arithmetic of two is if you multiply one, in other words, if you have a scalar multiplication, you're going to supposed to remember these are vectors. Eh? If you have a scalar multiplication, that's what you have. Okay, you have one times that, this is what you have. Okay, and then if you have the, so basically this is just trying to prove the multiples so in, in other words. Okay, let me see if there's any other questions someone is asking. Madam, what do you mean? You are not adding, but using an OR gate. Ivan, I'm not going to answer that. Please ask your friends to explain because I'm not going to answer that. It would be best if we are together, then I would be able to answer that. But since we are not, I think you ask your neighbors to explain. Ask, because some of you actually do get it. Eh? Some of you do get it. So ask your friends to explain how I get that. Okay, so let's move on. So, the best way, so because you remember the, when we are, I was using this example, I, it was two to the number of bits per symbol, sorry, the number of information bits that are entering our encoder are basically, okay, Kasim is so, so complaining, Kasim, you're not getting it. Kasim is not getting it. And uh, what's his name? Evan is not getting it. But you can ask Maria, Maria is getting it. Um, and several of you get me, and even Bidali Henry is getting it, so you ask him. Emmanuel Victor is getting it, you ask him. Okay, ask those people, they are getting it, they will explain to you how it is done. Okay, so what happens to the remainder? Actually, it's the remainder which we take. So, Ivan, Akoy, I'm not going to, you ask those people, they will explain to you. 
it is actually the remainder that we are interested in. It is the remainder which is we are interested in. It is the the other one which we discard. So it's the remainder. But anyway, you, you ask your friends, they will explain to you. So, so we took four information bits, and this is basically the subset of the four possible information bits. But remember, these are information bits. We need to append redundant bits. These are information bits. We need to append redundant bits. Now, the best way to do that is what we, we use, what we call the generator matrix. Every block code has a generator matrix. For instance, if you're using a repetition code, like I told you, you take one, if you have a rate of one, if your rate, your rate, remember the rate was a half, it means that you take one bit and multiply, multiply it by two. So you take one bit and append, another one bit. And how do you do that? You simply repeat the bits like we had, like we said, okay? You simply repeat the bits like we said. So to for ease, especially for very large codes, as we as you will find out if you're very curious enough, we use what, it becomes impossible to, to, to generate them using just, uh, I mean, you, you need a, a systematic way or you need a, a, a known way of how you're going to generate your redundant bits. And we do that by using what we call the generator matrix, okay? So in other words, the generator matrix is what represents our code. Even convolution codes, any code that you do have is actually represented by a, a generator matrix. It is the one that determines how our appended bits, in other words, our redundant bits are going to look like, okay? And the generator matrix is normally in this, is in this particular way. You have information bits multiplied by N. Remember N is the number, is the length of your code word, okay? N is the length of your code word. In other, in other words, the number of bits that are going to be being generated out of your encoder. So if we assume that the message bits are M up to MK, where K is the number of information bits, and you, you, you have your generator matrix, then how do you generate the, the redundant bits? So the redundant bits are given by M multiplied by G. So these are vectors eh? or matrices. So your information bits multiplied by the generator matrix. Your information bits multiplied by the generator matrix. Okay, one more bit before we continue. Most of the times we have what we call systematic generator matrices. So why, how does a systematic generator matrix look like? It has a, one side is an identity and the other is a parity. And the opposite can, can also be true. In other words, this, this generator matrix can as well be represented you can, oops, sorry. So in other words, this I, this identity matrix could be here and this parity matrix could be here. So it doesn't really matter, okay? So you can easily interchange them. What is very important for you is to realize that they are, to realize, to realize the, the consistency so that you do not make errors. Because if the identity is at the end, then you don't want to put it at the beginning. If it's at the beginning, you don't want to put it at the end, but these are interchangeably and they can be done as, as such, okay? So let's take an example of this generator matrix. As you can see, this is our parity. Oops. Okay, it's not accepting. So this is our parity, parity matrix. This is our parity matrix, and this is our identity matrix. Okay, how many information bits are in this generator matrix? How many information bits are in, in other words, what is our K multiplied by N? Our K multiplied by N, you can see that we are going to input three bits, one, two, three, and we are going to output six bits, one, two, three, four, five, six. So the number of columns are the number of bits that we're going to output. The number of rows are the number of bits that we are going to input. So if we are going to put three bits and output six bits, what is the rate of our encoder? Can you post your answers in the chat room? If we are going to put six bits 
So if you're going to put input three bits and output six bits, what is the code rate of our encoder? What's the code rate of our encoder? Our code rate is basically a half or 0 0.5. That is correct. OK, that is very correct. So because we are inputting three bits and outputting six bits, it means that our code rate is basically a half or 0 0.5, OK? So please take note of this generator matrix because remember, whatever we do at the receiver, sorry, whatever we do at the transmitter, we must do the opposite at the receiver. So that's very important. So we have what we call systematic generator matrices, but we also have non-systematic generator matrices. Now, non-systematic mat generator matrices, it means that we have a generator matrix, but which is not in this form. It is still an N by K matrix, but it is not in this form. Now, these are very important because we can see that in the systematic generator matrix, the information, in other words, the code word that is generated at the output contains part of the information and you simply add appendix, okay? It contains part of the information and you simply add an appendix, okay? So this is an example, okay, in other words, this is the output of your encoder. If you have this, this is the output of your encoder. And I want you to go and, and, and try and see if you can actually generate that output. Madam, what is the matrix? <laughs> and what does it mean? I am not going to answer that. Kevin Sonko, Kevin Sonko. I know you forgot because this is mathematics you learned long time ago, but even when you came, they taught, you, they taught you part of this mathematics in algebra. So please go back and revise your jam algebra because I'm not going to repeat this song. Call. I'm not going to repeat that. I am just going to assume that you are so clever and you understand. But anyway, maybe let me go through an example to help you appreciate this. Let me go through an example to help you to appreciate this. Because as I can see, most of you forgot long time ago. So let, it, let us go through an example to remind some of those, some of your colleagues who have already forgotten. Let's go through an example to remind some of your colleagues that have already forgotten. Okay. All right, so let's take an example of zero, zero, zero. Okay. I don't know if you still remember our generator matrix was one, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one, one. And then this was our parity. This is our parity. Okay. So this is our our parity, okay. And then the identity matrix was one, zero, 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 one, zero, and zero, zero, one. So this was our parity and this was our identity. Now our input, we said the input information is basically three bits, okay? So we are inputting. So if we input zero, zero, what is our output? So if we input zero, zero, let's calculate what our output. So the first bit is going to be, let's call them U1, U2, U3, okay? No, 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 these are M's, not, not U's. This is M1, M2, and M3, okay? So if we look at this, our first U is going to be what? Our U1 is going to be this times this, zero times one plus zero times that. No, 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 no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. The first one is zero. This is zero times 
one. What happened? The other zero disappeared. Okay. So you have zero times zero plus zero times zero plus zero times zero. So zero plus zero times plus zero times zero plus zero times one. And that is equal to I see someone is already giving me a wrong answer. What is that? Maria, Maria is saying it is one, really? I don't think so. What is zero times one? Zero times one is zero. Zero times zero is zero. Zero times one is zero. So this answer is what? Is zero. Okay. What about U2? U2 is going to be equal to what? U2 is going to be equal to U2 is going to be what? This times this. Okay. So this is, this times this is U1. This times this is U2. This times this is U3. This times this. Okay. So this is our now, this is what? This is zero. U2 is zero times one plus zero times one plus zero times zero, which is equal to, quickly, quickly. It is also equal to what? Zero, okay. What about U3, U3, U4, U5? U6, what is it? Can you take, can you give us the answer? So what is, in other words, what is U? U should be equal to, at least for the first two, we have zero. What about the third one? So it is zero throughout because you can see it's going to be zero. It's going to be zero times this. Zero times this. Zero times this. Zero times this. So it's going to be zero, 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 zero. So it is, it is zero, 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 zero. Okay, that is for M. That was for, what about for one, one, one? What is it? Can you give me the answer quickly? What about for one, one, one? Okay, so let's try to do for one, one. Okay, so U1 is equal to, so this is our M. Okay, so if this is our M, the first one be one times zero plus one times zero plus one times one. And that is equal to, Kato Ali, you're guessing. Kato Ali, you are guessing. That is not true. Stop guessing. So this is zero times zero, zero times, sorry, one times zero goes to zero. One times zero goes to zero. One times one equals to one. So zero plus zero plus one is equal to what? What is zero plus zero plus one? 
Zero plus zero plus zero equals two, one. Okay. You got one. What about the other one? What else do we have? Can you give me the next ones? Can you give me the final answer? Can you give me the final answer? The final answer for one, one, one should be Kato Ali, that is not true. Kato Ali, you are guessing. That is not true. Kato Ali, you are guessing. That is not true. And I want you to stop guessing. I expect the final answer to look like something like either you will get it like this one, 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 zero, 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 or it will be like zero, 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 one, 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 depending on where I start from. Kevin, that is wrong. This is the answer. This should be the answer I'm expecting. That should be the answer I am expecting. So if you don't have, so it's either like this or like this, depending on where you start from. Okay. So if you don't have that as your answer, then you're wrong. So if you do, this is one, one times, so the, the first one is one, isn't it? This is zero, zero, one. So the first one is one. The second one is one plus one, which is zero. Oh, wait a minute. This is one. Okay, I think this this one I've got it. This one might be my, my this might be wrong. Let's just check it out. So the first one is one. Sorry, this is zero. Zero. One, which is one. This is one, one, zero. So this is one plus one plus zero, which is be zero. Am I correct? This is one times one plus one times one plus zero. Sorry, plus one times zero. This is equal to zero. Okay, that's correct. Then the second one is zero plus one plus one, which is zero. The third one is one plus zero plus zero, which is equal to one. And the fourth one is, where are we? Is one, two, three. So the fifth one is zero. Let's do it again. Zero, one, zero. Let's do it again. This is zero, one, zero, which is one. And this is zero, this is also one. So there's something not right here. What is not right here? Let's do it again. This one is, oh, it might be me who made a mistake. Yeah, it is me who made, made a mistake. This is supposed to have been one. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I made a mistake in when I was, this was deleted. This got deleted and when I was writing it back, I made a mistake. It's supposed to have been one. It's supposed to have been one, zero, one. It's me who made a mistake. So this is supposed to be zero also. That is supposed to be zero. So this is what you expect, okay? So it's me who made a mistake here. When I was copying it, I had deleted it. When I was copying it, I put the wrong thing. And if you put, if you put, um, let's say what is, if you put, let's do it again. 
if you input zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, you should be getting, if you put zero, zero, one, you should be getting one, zero, one, zero, zero, one. Okay, so in other words, just go back. So if you work out from using this generator and using this possible code words, this is the answer that you should be getting. Now, I want you to note something, okay? Remember what I told you? That this type of generator is called a systematic generator matrix. In other words, what does that mean? It means that the information you are taking, you are just going to output the information plus the parity bits. And if you look at this, you will see that the information you're taking, you are taking the information and appending the parity bits. This is just unique to systematic encoders, okay? For instance, if you look at this, you are taking one zero zero and appending one one zero. So if you look at this, you will see that this has some similarity. So in other words, this information, this information is exactly this here. This information is exactly this here. This information is exactly this here. So you are simply taking the information and appending parity bits. You're simply taking the information and appending parity bits. You're simply taking the information and appending parity bits. This is common to any systematic generator matrix or a systematic encoder. We call this type of encoder a systematic encoder. It could be a, a systematic block code or a systematic convolution code, okay? And that's the beauty of having systematic codes because they simply take the information and append the generator, sorry, append redundant bits. Okay, so having seen, I hope we are together at this point. Uh, yes, we look like we are together at this point. So that's good. So. Remember what I told you that whatever you do at the, the whatever you do at the transmitter, you must do the opposite at the receiver. So in this particular case, we have a generator matrix at the transmitter. It means that the receiver, we must have the opposite. The opposite of a generator matrix is what we call the parity check matrix. The opposite of a generator matrix is what we call the parity check matrix. So for each generator matrix G, there exists the parity check matrix H such that the rows of the generator matrix are orthogonal to the rows of the parity. Now H is what stands for the parity matrix or parity check matrix. And if this is true, it means that if you take your, the output of your encoder, in other words, if you take what you have received at your receiver and multiply it by the parity check matrix, then it means you should receive zero. Why is it zero? Because the generator matrix is orthogonal to the parity check matrix. That's why you should get zero. So if the generator matrix is a systematic generator matrix, it also means that the parity check matrix is going to be a systematic parity check matrix. If this is your parity check, if this is your generator matrix, then this is your parity check matrix. Now remember, these are interchangeable. In other words, you can have a generator matrix which starts with I instead of P, okay? So if that is the case, it means that you're going to have the opposite of the parity check matrix. So do not say, madam, you gave us this and you have brought the opposite because what I'm trying to tell you is that these positions are interchangeable, okay? It, it, what is important is that you are consistent for any given encoder, okay? 
Okay, so I think that is good. And this is how you find the parity check matrix. Okay, so if this is your generator matrix, this is how you find the parity check matrix. If this is your generator matrix, this is how you find the parity check matrix. And the opposite is also true. If you're given the parity check matrix, you can find the generator matrix like that. So these are interchangeable. Even the positions of these are interchangeable. So what is important is that you, 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 you pay attention to the, the, the position of your parity matrix and the position of your identity matrix. That's what is important. So remember, you have input your information. Now you must remove the errors. And in block codes, we use what we call syndrome decoding. In block codes, we use what we call syndrome decoding, which simply states that if you receive your code word and your code word was received in error, then if you do the actual decoding, because remember we say that if this is true, then your code word which you're receiving multiplied by the disparity check matrix, it must give you a zero. But if your code word was received in error, this is not going to be zero. And if this is not zero, then it means that an error has occurred. And if an error has occurred, then it is important that the decoder attempts to correct the error. So that's what syndrome decoding is, is saying. It says that if you receive the code word and you received it without, you received it in, if you received the code word and you received it without error, then your syndrome should be equal to zero. But if you receive, if you receive the code word and you received it in error and your syndrome is not equal to zero, then it means that an error has occurred. And it, okay, in other words, the syndrome is not equal to zero for an invalid code word. So if it's an invalid code word, because remember, the code words you must have sent, for instance, if we're looking at this, this must be the code words. So if you did, you receive any code word which is not this, it means that the code word you have received is you have received it in error. And therefore, if you have received it in error, then you must try to attempt and remove the error. Now, we are not really going to go through that in the attempt trying to remove errors, okay? But I'm just trying to, in this particular course, all I'm trying to do, or either your course is trying to show you how actually the actual decoding is done. We will do the actual decoding of errors when you are looking at convolution codes. So if you receive this, then it means that you have received the, the code word in error. And if you have received the code word in error, then you must try to make sure you attempt to correct the code word. Okay. So we have seen generator matrix. We've seen the opposite of a generator matrix, which is the parity check matrix. The next step we have seen is what we call the syndrome decoding, which is done for block codes. And then, and if your syndrome code is not equal to zero, in other words, if your syndrome S is not equal to zero, then it means that you have received the code in error. And therefore, if you have received the code in error, you should attempt to correct the error because that's why we are doing channel coding. We are trying to remove errors. And why, you, why are we removing errors? So that we can have reliable information. And if we have reliable information, that it means that we are having an effective communication system, which is desirable. And if we are going to do any communication, if you're going to do any removing errors, then we should bear in mind the, the basis of channel, channel coding theorems. One with the capacity, the other is the data compression, but in this particular case, we are looking at channel coding. What does it say? It says that if you're going to have any minimal errors or if you're going to effectively communicate your information reliably without errors or minimal errors, then you must make sure that the code you choose must meet the condition. In other words, the information you're trying to transmit over your channel should not be greater than the channel capacity. So whatever you do, you must make sure that you meet within those conditions. Okay, so there's this example. Can someone find out? I'm not going to go through this, okay? Can, can you, in your own time, go through this and see if this is an example of a received vector, can you find out if this is your error, can you find out whether this code word is a valid code word or in valid code word? Okay, please do go through that. 
So next we look at Hamming distance. Hamming distance is a very important uh, parameter in, in codes. Actually, I know we are looking at block codes, but it is also used in, in convolution codes. What is the Hamming distance? The Hamming distance is the distance between two code words. In other words, it's the number of positions of bits which are different, okay? And this we know from our algebra. From algebra, we can find the Hamming distance. So in other words, the Hamming distance is the distance, in, uh, is the difference between two code words. The difference between two code words can be taken as either a summation or a subtraction, okay? In this case, if you have two code words, U and V, what is the Hamming distance between these two code words? It is the number of bits in, the number of position in which the bits are different. For instance, the first bit is the same. So that is zero. The second bit is not the same. The third bit is the same. The fourth bit is not the same. The fifth is not the same. The sixth is not the same. The seventh is the same. The eighth is the same. The ninth is not the same. The tenth is the same and eleventh is not the same. So what is the Hamming distance? It is one, two, three, one, two, three, wait a minute, this is one. I'm wondering why I have five and not six. It's one, two, three, four, five, six. So this should be six, not five. Okay, this should be six. Let's do it again. This is one, two, three, four, five, six. It should be six and not five. Okay, it's the number of bits in which they are different. And this is one, two, three, four, five, six. So if there are six bits, there are six positions in which the bits are different. The last bit is the same, okay, I think. Oh yes, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. At least people are awake, that is good. So it is actually five, I was wondering. So it is me who made a mistake. Then uh, I'm the one who confused myself. This should have been in black. Eh? This should have been in black. This should have been in black. This should be black. Okay. So the number of differences, of course, we know you can get the difference either by addition or subtraction. Okay. The difference, we can get it either by addition or subtraction. So if you view and V are two code vectors, then U plus V must also be the code vector for a linear block code. That one we already discussed. The distance between the two code vectors is equal to the weight. So we have the Hamming distance, which is the difference between two code ones, okay? But also we have what we call the Hamming weight. We have what we call the Hamming distance and the Hamming weight. Now the Hamming weight is the number of bits which are not equal to zero. The number of bits in a code word which are not equal to zero. For instance, the Hamming weight of this code is one, two, three, four, five. The Hamming weight of this code U is the number of bits in which this code is not equal to zero. So this is one, two, three, four, five. And the Hamming weight of V is one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So the Hamming weight of U, V is six, the Hamming weight of U is V. Now in most cases, they design codes in such a way that the Hamming weight is equal to the Hamming distance, but it's not really, uh, it's not the big deal, okay? But that's what, that's, that's what they try to do. So the minimum distance of a linear code equals to the minimum weight of its code vectors. So, but this, 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 this though can be like, for instance, if we were to add this, this would be one, two, three, 
four, five. Okay. So what they are referring, what this slide is referring to is actually that particular equation. But generally speaking, the mean the humming the humming weight or humming the minimum distance or the humming weight is the number of bits in which the code one is not equal to zero. Now those two those two are very important. The humming distance, the humming distance and the humming weight are very important because they help us to correct the errors. They help us to correct the errors. Okay. So the number of bits or the number of errors that can be corrected by a block code is actually given so by this equation. Okay. If you have bits, in other words, if you have errors which are more than that, it means that you cannot correct them. So remember what we said at the beginning that forward error correction is the possibility that you'll be able to detect the errors. So you have detected the errors. Let's say you have five errors. That's what you have seen that you have. You have. Then you attempt to correct the errors. Sometimes you are not successful in correcting all the errors. Okay, so that's what this equation is basically saying that you are able to detect D mean minus one errors. But unfortunately, you can only correct D mean minus one divided by two errors. So if your D mean, for instance, was five, it means that you can, you can detect how many errors, you can detect that there are four errors. However, you can only correct two errors. That's what it means. If your D mean is seven, it means you can detect six errors, but you can only correct three errors. You can detect six errors, but you can only be able to, to what? To detect three errors. Okay, so let's find out what is the humming weight of this code? What is the humming weight? Okay, the answers are already there. But of course, we know that we say the humming weight is the number of, of bits in which there are number of bits which are not equal to zero. So for instance, in this one, we know that there, there are only zeros. They are all zeros, so the humming weight is zero. Here, we have only one, two, three, so the humming weight is three. Here is one, two, three, four. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. Okay, so I would love to stop here, but maybe since we have a bit of time, let's go back and do this example, which I wanted us to do. Actually, the number of ones in the code word. Yes, the number of ones in the code word. Yeah, thanks, Isaac. So anyway, since we have some time, a little bit of time, let's go back and do this example, which I wanted you to do. What is it? Yes, let's do this. If this is the code word you have received, write down this code one. If this is what you have received, if this is what you have received, if this is what you have received, write it down. Can you go and find the syndrome? Let's go back and find the syndrome. Now I want to stop here for, for this one, but I want us to go through this, this example. Then on Friday, I and on Friday we fix the lecture, I will start at eight sharp because we have only one hour, we don't have time for wasting. So on Friday, we shall look at convolution codes and hopefully we can find, finish convolution codes. And when we finish convolution codes, then we shall look at trellis codes, okay? And hopefully if we can finish trellis codes, then we can. We can first go and look at this receiver design, then we come back and look at the actual examples because I tend to do this work together. I tend to, to combine receivers together with, co co o o with coding because with channel coding, you remember in channel coding, you also have the decoding and the decoding and the performance is, is the one that determines whether you have made errors. So the, the decoding is done at the receiver. Okay, so and how much errors you are going to, to be making, you can only detect that at the receiver. So that's why I want us to first go through the receiver design, 
then we can then look at the different examples. Okay, so who has the answer? What did, what do you have? It's very unfortunate that we are really not going having physical lectures, but <laughs> of course you know what has happened. So I'm hoping that you're understanding because every time I ask you actually don't answer back. So I don't know whether you, 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 you have understood or not. So let's go back and do this. Since we have time, let's go back and do this. Since we have a bit of time, let's do this. Okay, I'm just going to stop sharing so that I, oops, oops, sorry, sorry. I want us to go through this together. I want us to go this, through this together. Okay. So you have your metrics. You have your metrics. So the metrics was your generator matrix was what? Was one, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, zero one, 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 zero, zero. Zero, one, zero, 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 one. And we said that this was your identity matrix, which is a K by K matrix. And this is your parity check matrix, which is an N minus K by an N minus K matrix. And we are saying, that you need to find the H matrix, which is your parity check matrix. And from, from our definition, we say that if this is our G matrix, which we are trying to write as our P, actually this is, so sorry, this is a bit wrong. This is the other way around. This is a bit wrong. This one is not supposed to be there. It's supposed to be like that. Okay. So if this is our parity matrix, which is basically, okay, multiplied by N. Of course, these are supposed to be small letters. Well, well, let's see if I can make them smaller. And we're saying that our parity check matrix is basically given by I. Now, this time our I is N minus K multiplied by N minus K. Okay. And then we're having P transpose. Okay. And then we have N minus K multiplied by K. Okay, so if this is our parity check matrix, sorry, if this is our generator matrix, if this is our generator matrix, what is our parity check matrix? If this is our generator matrix, what is our parity check matrix? So what is H? If this is, what is H? Remember, the first one is given by that, is an identity matrix, which is basically N minus K, N minus K, isn't it? So N minus N is equal to six and K is equal to three. So this is an a three by three identity matrix, which is one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one. Okay. And then this 
is the transpose. Have you seen? It is P transpose. So in other words, it is the transpose of this. It is the transpose of this. So if you transpose this, it means that this becomes the columns and this one becomes the other way around. This becomes the rows and this becomes the columns. So if I transpose this, I'm going to have one, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one, one. So now this is my H. That is my H. And we're saying that the syndrome S is given by our R multiplied by H transpose. And we are saying that our R is equal to one zero one 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 zero. Therefore, what is S? Therefore, what is S? From this equation and this H and this R, we should be able to find what S is. So S is equal to, we have our R, which we are saying is one, zero, one, 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 zero. And we are multiplying it with H transpose. We are multiplying it with H transpose. H transpose is one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one, 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 zero, zero, one, 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 zero, one. Therefore, S is equal to, let's, let's start with S1. What is S1? S1 is equal to one times one plus zero times zero plus one times zero plus one times one plus one times zero plus zero times one, which is equal to one plus, which is equal to what? What are your answers? Post your answers in the chat room. Kasim is saying zero, what about you? Isaac is saying zero, what about the rest of you? What do you have, what do you get? Because this is one plus zero plus zero plus one plus zero plus zero, which is equal to zero. So that is S1, what about S2? What is S2? Oops. So S1 is equal to zero. S1 equals to zero. So what about S2? S1 equals to zero. What about S2? Oops, sorry. No, no, no. What is S2? So S2 is one. 
one times zero plus one times, sorry, it's plus zero plus times one plus one times zero. For the other way around, this was one. Yeah? Plus one times one. Where are we? That's number four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So one times one plus one times one times one, two, three, four, five. Plus zero times zero. Which is equal to? What's the answer? You tell me the answer. What is S2? S2 equals to? What is S2? So S2 is also equal to zero. And S3 equals to, so you can, you can go and do also, what S3 equals to. So I see most of you are already complaining. You have already fallen, fallen off the chart because you are busy telling me how you have a, an exam or a cut. <laughs> but you came late. So if you really want us to finish early, why don't you come early? OK? So anyway, we can stop here since most of you are falling off. So on, on Friday, we shall start at 8 sharp. So whoever comes late, they will find when we have already started. Okay, bye, all the best.